Hello, everyone. I'd like to seed an idea in all of you that we can feed the population of the world we have today of 7 billion with less environmental problems than you can imagine if we followed one, just one core principle that all ecosystems follow. Now, to demonstrate this principle, the forest is a good example. A forest feeds a multitude of life forms without depleting its resources. And when you go into a forest, you find that the soil is fertile, not eroded off, um, or leached. It's moist, and it's loose and aerated. And this is on its own. You see the sample of soil over here? It looks pretty good. And there's absolutely no human internet intervention whatsoever. There's no one fertilizing the forest. There's no one irrigating it. There's no plowing to loosen the soil. And there's absolutely no pesticides being used. Now, let's look at the Amazon. The Amazon is thought to be nearly 100 million years old. Not just survived the Ice Age, but thrived through the Ice Age, apparently. And this is because forests are extremely resilient. They're resilient, they're self-renewing, and they get better and more productive over time. So they're beyond sustainability into a system we call regenerative systems. And the forest does this seemingly effortlessly. Forest plants and trees require the same nutrients our agricultural crops require. And animal world in the forest require exactly the same nutrients we require. Whilst outside the forest, we have a crisis. The farmers lack water, the soil is deemed infertile, their land is often salty today. The cost of living for the farmers is increasing, and there are numerous farmer suicides. Farmers are getting cancer at an alarming rate. There's a train that's called the cancer train now in the farming region of Punjab. This train is full every day and it goes to the cancer hospital. These problems are often based on resource scarcity and overpopulation. If you look at the world population of approximately 7.3 billion and we were to fit this population in Indonesia, this is Indonesia, it's a set of islands, then each human being would have 263 square meters to survive in. If we were to fit the same population in the Amazon, each person would have over three quarters of a kilometer square to live in. If you look at this piece of land here, already contains enough biomass, already contains enough fertility, and probably building material to house a single person, if not more. How do we reconcile these differences between inside forests and outside of forests? What are we doing wrong? If you look at a forest, the forest is completely packed. There's green absolutely everywhere. If you look at the canopy, there's no sunlight coming through. If you look at the sides of a forest, it's also packed. If you go into the forest through this hole in which I went, you look up and point the camera and you can actually take a photograph. The sun doesn't come through. The strategy the forest follows, a very important strategy, is that it tries to harvest every ray of sunlight it receives. The canopy layer I've just shown you, there are sub-canopy layer, there's a shrub layer, there's a creeper layer, there's a ground cover, these are the creepers. And there are epiphytes, there are plants living on plants, there, is, there are mosses. Anywhere where there's sunlight, there's something green harvesting it. And where there's no sun, there's leaf litter or the odd plant that finds a little sun. So here we go, summary. Everything is harvesting sunlight. So to run itself, it harvests the sunlight via photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes the energy of the sun and converts it to chemical energy, a form we all all of life, including the plants, can use for energy and food to run itself. Energy is stored in the plant. The plant is akin to a battery. This is a huge battery storing energy in its roots, trunk, stem, leaves, and fruit. When you burn twigs or even a whole trunk, you get a lot of heat and light. This is the energy of the sun being released here. So one strategy is to capture all the sunlight it receives. 
So to harvest sunlight, we've got biodiversity, and now it can run itself. It can be sustainable. Because of this biodiversity, we have fertility. This is a periodic table. What's circled are all the mineral nutrients that a plant requires. If you look at a rock face or a soil profile, you see different colors. Each color represents a different mineral. Here's a soil profile. Now, if you look at a biodiverse forest, you have different root architectures, different depths that roots are going to. Each plant is mining something different. Each plant is mining a different mineral because it's going to different layers. And taken together with all its leaves, fresh and dry, fruit and flowers, huge amounts of biomass on the forest floor, each tiny bit containing a mineral or another. So taken together, the entire complement of minerals required for the forest is on the forest floor now. Once you have plant biodiversity, you get animal biodiversity. So you get dead animals, their dung, and nitrogen and phosphates and all of the above come now from this mass of biomaterial which needs to decay. The only way that you're going to get decay is if your soil organisms are alive. They are alive only if your soil is wet and dark. The way soil is wet, loose and dark is because the fo forest has harvested sunlight. It's not allowed any sunlight to come in and it's left the floor with leaves. If you dig one inch deep into a forest soil, you get moisture. And this soil has not been irrigated, or it's not been rained on for six months. And at one inch deep, and you get a worm, and you get dampness. So overview, dead animals, biodiverse dead animals, animal dung, leaf litter, and fallen fruit, taken together with the life in the soil, gives you fertility. Additional fertility is got by nitrogen-fixing bacteria and something called mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza are like fungi, and they are like an internet network between roots. They tell each other, they tell plants of disease, and they share nutrients. This is, again, a very secure system a forest can has. Mycorrhiza and bacteria will only live if there are no pesticides used and if the forest floor is damp. Biology in the soil, life in the soil, digging away, living, moving, they create soil structure. They make the soil loose. So now we have fertility because of the harvest of sunlight. How does the forest get water when it's not raining? Our forest here doesn't rain for six months. Condensation. Every surface area now in the morning has condensate on it. Because of the harvest of sunlight, there's a huge amount of surface area, and then we have irrigation every morning. The bees and the snakes drink this water. So now you have all these roots holding water and preventing erosion. And when you rot life, you get carbonaceous material. This carbonaceous material, you can see going black here, rotting, gives you good loose black soil. Carbon in the soil is charged. Water is charged. Soluble minerals are charged. So the forest soil holds water because of the carbon in it, and it also holds its nutrients. Forest soil now will not get leached. Nutrients remain because of the carbon in the soil. Minerals and water leave when there's an irrigation on, on, in a farm and you have to keep then fertilizing. Here you don't have to keep fertilizing and the minerals and the nutrients and the water, everything is released as a time release capsule. So everyone has enough. There's no need for spacing or weeding anymore. Every plant has enough nutrients to pack it in like as in a forest. So soil carbon is a sponge, a reservoir, prevents leaching. We also have forests that attract rain. Because of the evapotranspiration going on in trees, which means water from the roots going up the tree and out through the leaves, creates an environment where condensation is encouraged. And so you get rainfall over forests. So now we have biodiversity giving, uh, sunlight harvesting leading to biodiversity, and biodiversity giving us water, pest resistance. 
Pests are species specific. And so if you have a monoculture, the pest that comes along has a supermarket in front of him. He'll just eat and reproduce and you get devastation. Here, you don't. There are obstructions to its growth and progress. Different smells and colors attract pests. A pest will go to its flower because of a color or a smell. If you confuse them with all the different flowers and smells, they don't know where to go, they don't know where to infect. They're also kept in check by predators. It's the biodiversity working here. And soil biodiversity, the soil organisms we've just talked about, they outcompete pathogenic ones. As fertility increases, plant immunity also increases. And as I showed you earlier, mycorrhiza under the ground sharing nutrients also gives information of disease. And plants then set up their own defense response prior to the infection. So now we have a maximum harvest of sunlight leading to disease-free forest. Here's a very complicated slide meant for you just to see that all you have to do is harvest sunlight and maximally and you have the energy to be sustainable and the rest follows. You will have soil fertility, soil structure, pest resistance, bioremediation, prevention of erosion, prevention of evaporation, rain and no leaching. All you have to do is maximally harvest sunlight. And why is it self-renewing? You have your shade, and you have your biodiversity and decomposition. Then you have animal biodiversity, plant biodiversity. This is a cycle. Sunlight, biodiversity, shade, and soil biodiversity, more fertility, more animals, more plants. More. This is why it keeps getting bigger and better over time. So the lesson here is that energy is the limiting factor for sustainability. If you look at this oasis here, you only have growth where you can harvest sunlight, where there's a bit of water. And once it's started, then it creates its own water and its own condensation and other things. So the size of an ecosystem is dependent on the energy it can harvest. This is a much smaller ecosystem. Now we, as humans, are busy living off energy harvested millions of years ago. We have wasted and not done anything about the energy we've got on this earth for a long time. Because of its scarcity and its cost, the cost of living is also rising. The earth is a closed system, which it is, and we harvest all the energy we've got. We'd be pretty sustainable, that's my bet. It's not very hard to grow anything. Things happen on its own. It's not hard, so you leave it and things grow. These plants require the same nutrients we do, and they're doing it on their own. So, if we, use the lessons of the forest. We can grow food anywhere. No soil is deemed unsuitable for agriculture. Here I'm showing you what I did in a small space using the forest technique. Here, this is enough food for two days for me, enough vegetables from two square meters. This is a terrace garden, so we have concrete at the bottom. Using waste, which the forest does, all its waste is, is composted, is decomposed, Using just waste, we've created a terrace garden which is harvesting all the sunlight except the path. We've got a papaya plant. You can see the building behind. It's a terrace garden in Bombay. We've got a banana plant. We've got a coconut. We've got enough vegetables for a family of four on a terrace. This is my farm. It's got bamboo all over it. The soil was a pH 4, which is in unbelievably acidic for soil. Bamboo roots matting underground, and absolutely everyone, even permaculturists, said, you can't grow anything here. Most people believe you can't grow anything under bamboo. I tried, I put nitrogen-fixing plants, I did cow dung, cow urine, we irrigate this every day, nothing happened. Did the forest method, which was basically creating forest soil, the way the forest creates it. And in a month, we got that. It, this is okra. And in three months, two and a half months, we were feeding eight people vegetables. And this is a very small plot. See here, there's corn, there's beans here, peas here, the red spinach, there's watermelon on the ground, there are chilies. It's, hu it's hugely productive. This was three weeks of work using the forest floor technique, something I've developed, something I teach. And you can do this in large spaces too. That's my farm on the right, and that's an Amazon on the left. 
So we've got a food forest on my farm. Every, cr every plant is a food plant and looks like a forest and it works like a forest. We don't do anything, we only harvest. That's rice growing using the forest flow method, dry forest flow method. Now we go to the farmers, what are they doing? They first terrace, then they burn, then they plow, and then they salt. The terracing removes the topsoil, so you've got zero fertility. Then you burn all your soil organisms and anything else that was alive. Uh, and you remove all the stuff so nothing rots back there. You plow, remove, and you should see how many birds are near plows. All the worms come up and they're eaten up. And then you fertilize and pesticide. These are all salts. And then you irrigate from groundwater. You know groundwater is salty. So irrigation every day. You get salinization of soils and they're deemed unsuitable for agriculture. We in permaculture can remedy this quite fast, but that's another story. This is a typical poor farmer's field. The weeds are growing everywhere, but not where he's farmed. Look what he's done to the soil. No wonder he's in debt, and no wonder he's killing himself. So now he's in a vicious cycle, this poor farmer. Don't read the slide, it's meant to just show you what a mess it is. All he's doing is destroying the topsoil and the life. So nutrients are depleted and the cycle goes on. The cycle goes on. That's all his, the previous techniques destroy the soil. This is a picture taken by NASA showing how much land has been desertified in the past several years. So, linked environmental problems to bad farming methods, the long list, polluted water, desertification, soil erosion, food scarcity and deforestation are some. So what can we do? Permaculture. Permaculture addresses all human needs with absolutely no environmental impact. These needs are of food, water, shelter, and energy. Permaculture is not just about growing food or farming. It's how you live. It's everything. If you don't want to do permaculture, these are some pointers you may do. Grow your own food. Subsidize. Tell your government to subsidize soil building and leave the rest. They don't have to subsidize anything else because subsidies is something we're all paying for. Turn waste into energy or fertility and value biodiversity. It's very important for fertility and life. And I would suggest you don't burn waste and please tell your governments not to set up development projects in forests. There's enough barren land to do them on. And please minimize the use of agrochemicals. Thank you very much.